teenagers in my house. Um, I'm excited to, uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, it, it's good, it's good. Um, I, I was really excited, um, really, really excited to, to, to speak on this message and this topic, and then it kind of hit me a little bit that, man, this is, this is a tough one too, because as I, I struggled this week as I was trying to prepare, as I was trying to do this, and, and let me explain a little bit, because I want to see Christ following people be on fire for him and not be lukewarm. But I also know that our culture, the American church, sometimes preaches something different than what I see in Scripture. And one of the things that's really hard right now is that on any given Sunday or pretty much any given day of the week, you can go online and you can hear some of the best communicators from around the U.S. and around the world, and they can preach, and they can speak, and they, they, they're eloquent, and, and, and they are gifted individuals of speaking. But what I hope is that we're actually speaking, and what they are speaking is the truth of what Scripture is, and not just something else. Uh, next week, uh, Pastor Susan is going to speak on this idea of how culture um, has influenced uh, the church instead of the church influencing co uh, culture and how we have kind of messed this up a little bit. And I think that's kind of the, the setup even for today. I think that, that, that understanding this, this passage that we're going to is one of the things because culture, especially American culture, has kind of, kind of messed this up. So what you hear le last week, what you're going to hear today, what you're probably going to hear the next couple weeks kind of goes against the flow of a lot of what I think is out there and what we hear. And these messages that I think our American churches are, are preaching kind of bring up questions for unbelieving people or even believing people. Questions like this. Let me give you an example. If God wants you to be financially prospering, then why is so much of the world poor? If God's goal for you is to be, to be financially prospering, then why is so much of the world? I actually looked up a statistic. The average salary around the world for a month is $1,480, which is about $18,000 a year. Most of the world, the average for the world, lives on $18,000 a year. But I hear so many people and so many pastors and so many churches are like, God wants you to be financially happy. And, 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 and so it raises questions for me. And it raises questions, I think, for others. Because if God wants that, why is so much of the world poor? Or this question, right? Um, it, it, life is supposed to work out for the good of the people. I kind of preached on that last week, one of those passages, right? Then why, doesn't, why does it not work out for everyone? Why does one family get blessed with the miracle of, of someone being healed or, or someone being freed from cancer, yet this other family has someone that painfully dies of cancer? If all things work out for the good, and these are some of the messages I think that are preached, like, like why is it that one family gets blessed to have children and this family never gets the grace or the blessing of children? Why does one person experience so much joy and maybe love from a family and yet someone else experiences so much pain and hurt and dysfunction from family? See, it's questions like this that, that are tough to wrestle with because I believe what we've done is we've mixed the, the idea of being a Christ follower with the idea of the American dream. I actually went to the Oxford um, Dictionary. It's the, English, the Oxford English Dictionary, and I think I have this one for you. Uh, uh, I, it's the, what their definition is of the American dream, and it's the idea that every citizen of the United States will have equal opportunities to achieve success and prosperity through hard work, determination. Uh, it's this idea that, that everyone... Everyone, maybe with some hard work, a little, a little blood, sweat, and tears, everyone can prosper. And it makes sense because if you look at the, the beginning of the Declaration of Independence, it says, you know, that all people, all men are created equal. And then it uses these three words, and, and it's this pursuit of, of these three things that, that our Declaration even says. That's life, liberty, and what? The pursuit of what? Happiness. Happiness. Oh. Our Constitution promotes similar things. It secures the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity. To secure the blessing of liberty 
to ourselves and to our prosperity. So what our culture has been built on is this idea of prosperity. You come here, you prosper. If you don't like your status, you work harder, you gain more, you get more, and, and it's good. And it's this American dream that's here. And I'm not saying that it's all bad, but what has happened is it has creeped into the church and it has influenced, I think, the American church in such a way that now we expect God to do stuff, and so we put these expectations on God. God, I expect you to come through. I expect you to bless me. I expect you to do this. And it's no wonder that it's creeped in because of this. Now, I need to say this. I'm glad that we live in America. I'm glad of the freedoms that we have today. I'm glad that I don't have to worry about my family being, having horrible things done to them because of the profession that I feel like I've been called into. I don't have to worry about threat. We don't have to worry about someone coming in today and 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 hauling most of us away to jail or, or hiding in secrecy or, or not being able to carry a Bible or to publicly pray. We don't have to worry about those things because of the country we live in. And I'm thankful for those things. But the problem I have is this. Our expectations that sometimes we put on God. Actually, that's the bottom line. What I want you to walk away from today, it's this. When we make God fit our expectations We make him into more of a little God. When we make God fit our expectations of who God is, of what God should do, and how he should come through for us, it really quite makes him into a little God. Have you ever had that moment where you've had high expectations for something and then then it didn't come through and it's like, oh. Or maybe you had really low expectations, and then, and then, and then in the moment, it, it, it exceeded any kind of expectations you had. Expectations are tricky. They're a tricky thing because we all have them, and most of the time, we evaluate our experience on those expectations. We evaluate how good or bad something is, whether that expectation was met or not met. I love the Avengers movie series that's out there. Um, and the very first one, uh, if you don't know it, find someone with Disney Plus. You can watch them all. But uh, Loki's coming. He's trying to take over America. He's trying to take over the, basically the, the, the earth, the world, and, and bring his creatures here. And, and there's this statement that he makes in the middle of it, and it's always stuck with me because he says, you should bow to me as a god. And then a few scenes later, you have the Hulk beating the ever-living stuffing out of him, and he's like thrown around like a... And then he says the statement, I love it, he's like, puny God. (laughs) You see, when we start to apply those expectations to our Christian walk, I think we think that, that there's these things that God is supposed to do for us. There's these things that God has to do for us, and there's these expectations that we put on God. And when we start to put all of these expectations on God, which shouldn't be there, and and, and it doesn't happen, then it starts us down a path of disappointment. And so God doesn't meet this expectation, and so now I start to question myself. I start to question my faith. I start to question God. I start to question all these things because my expectation wasn't met of God. We've mentioned it a couple times, and I think a few of us have used it, but our staff's going through this book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And and the author in this this book, one of the chapters that we just read this last week, um, um, he, he says this, and I wanted to read it to you. It says, God is not an object that I can uh, determine, master, possess, or command. And still I try somehow to use my clear idea about God to give me power over him. To somehow possess him. Unconsciously, I make this deal with God that goes something like this. I obey, my, my, uh, I obey and keep my part of the bargain. Now bless me. Not only. Do not only any. Sorry, I don't even know what that says. It, <laughs> God doesn't appreciate, appreciate being demoted to the rank of our personal secretary or assistant. It's saying that we've demoted God into such a way because we put all of our expectations onto him. 
We try to make God fit our expectations of what he should do and how he should do it and when he should do it and how he's supposed to come through. And if those expectations don't get met, then we start to question everything. We're not the first person to do this. One of the things I like about scripture is we get to look into some different lives and how they dealt with those things. See their stories and see how God responded to them. So well, help me out here for a second. Who was John the Baptist in the Bible? Jesus' cousin. Jesus' cousin. Yeah, someone, you said it, Kurt, right? He was John the Baptist. It came before Jesus, right? Prepared the way for Jesus. Very significant, right? He was baptized Jesus as he would start his ministry, right? Kind of a crazy guy. If the scripture says, like, like people looked at him as... as I don't know, maybe a fanatic is what we would call him today. He would like had his face painted and it said, Jesus is the only way, baptizing people out in the... That might be the message translation, but... No, nah, like people looked at him as kind of strange because he ate weird things and kind of was unkept and lived out in the desert. But he prepared this way for Jesus and, and, and he baptized Jesus And he had all of these cool things that were happening. Now, if you have your Bible and you want to turn to Luke chapter 7, please do so because we're going to spend a little bit of time in here. And in Luke chapter 7, starting at verse 18, it says this. It said, then John's disciples told him, told John, right, about all these things. So John summoned two of his disciples. He sent them to the Lord asking, are you the one who is coming Or should we expect someone else? When the men reached him, they said, John the Baptist sent us to ask you, are you the one who is coming? Or should we expect someone else? Let's unpack this for a second. I'd like to put things in my own mind, which is a scary thing. And I like to try to put them like what was actually being said there. And, and John's disciples come to John, and, and, and they're having this conversation, and they're talking, and his disciples are like, look, you don't understand what's going on. Like, Jesus is out there opening it up. Some of you know what opening it is? They got a healing, and they got a healing, and they got a healing, and you get a healing. Everyone gets a healing. It's a bad joke. It's right. Some of you have no idea who Oprah is, and that's okay, too. But they have this conversation. He's like, Jesus is out there doing all this. Everyone's getting healed. You know, he's even like brought people back from the dead and he's cast out evil spirits and, and people's needs are getting met. And, and man, it's like this, this amazing thing that's happening. And I wonder if John sitting in prison was like, are you kidding me right now? Like all this is happening And I'm stuck here in prison? And I wonder if he was like, hey, you know what? You need to go ask him some questions. I need you to go ask Jesus some questions. And you see the question they asked? It's up there still, right? It says, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? John the Baptist asked this question about Jesus. Are you the Messiah Or should someone else, we'd be expecting someone else. Think about this. Think back to the life. And maybe you don't know all of John the Baptist. Before they were even born, Mary with Jesus inside of her and and Elizabeth with John inside of him. When Mary entered a room, John the Baptist leaped. Scripture says this this, this, this piece of their life is so important that somebody documented it. That that he actually leaped because of Jesus' presence being there. That was before they were even born. Or maybe it was the baptism. Maybe it was during this baptismal time and, and John was there and he even says to Jesus, man, man I'm, not even un, I'm not even worthy of, of taking off your shoes, man. But he baptizes Jesus and he hears this voice and he sees this thing happen with Jesus that had to be absolutely amazing. That's the same John the Baptist. That's who we're talking about. He's the, he's the guy that sometimes, because he prepared the way for Jesus, people would confuse Jesus and John the Baptist. 
Remember later when, when Jesus was like, man, who do people say I am? Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're these things. And, and, and that's, who, that's who people confuse John the Baptist for. That's the same guy. And at some point, something changed. Here's what, we, here's what we know. Sometime after Jesus was baptized, and I don't know how long it went, John the Baptist was imprisoned. And the reason he was imprisoned was he actually calls out uh, uh, a Herod. Um, uh, he, he calls him out, and he's imprisoned by this Herod because he, he condemns the king's marriage to his new wife. And he had grounds to condemn this marriage because basically this older brother had a wife. She didn't want to be with him anymore, and she had, they had a daughter. And so she left that wife, and then she went to her, his younger brother and ended up getting married to him and had their daughter there. And, and all this stuff was weird. And, and so it forced the, the first husband to divorce his wife, and it's just this weird, messed-up family dynamic I can't imagine what Thanksgiving was like at their house because it would be kind of awkward and weird. But this is going on. And Jesus calls out Herod for this. He doesn't like it, so he throws him in prison. So wife leaves older brother for his younger brother. So the older brother has to divorce her. She took her daughter with her from the first marriage. And now she is dancing for her second husband who is now king. Now, now Herod intentionally, I don't think, wanted to kill, to kill John, and, and he was kind of scared of him because he had a following. He knew people listened to him. He, he knew he was a holy man, and so he was, he was scared to just have him killed. But however, after his stepdaughter danced for him at a birthday party, he said, I'll give you one thing that you can do. And the mother of this daughter convinced her to say, you know what, I want John's head on a platter. I was actually doing some, some research and I was doing some, some things. There's actually this, this whole movement of trying to find John the Baptist's head and people have been searching for it and, and claiming for it because they want to find it because they feel like it's this holy relic. It's really weird. But most of the stuff on the internet's really weird anyway. But think about this. John's hearing everything that Jesus is doing. People are getting healed. Sickness is leaving. Leprosy is leaving. People are being raised from the dead. Like the, the sight is going back to the blind. The hearing is going back to the deaf. People's needs are getting met. John is hearing all of this about what's going on with other people. And here he is stuck in prison. And I'm sure he thought, what about me? When is it my turn? So John sends his disciples to ask Jesus, man, are you the real deal? Or should we be expecting something else? Let's keep reading. Verse 21 says this. It says, at that time, Jesus healed many people of disease, afflictions, and evil spirits. And he granted signs to, sight to many blind people. He replied to them, go and report to John what you have seen, what you have heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are clean, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. What I feel like Jesus' response was what his response to John was I'm not going to sweep in and rescue you. And you need to be okay with that.
That one was on me, Phil. <clears throat> First one, you. Second one, me. I feel like Jesus' response to John was this. I'm not going to rescue you. You're blessed when you still love me, John. Even though I didn't meet your expectations. A while back, I, I did a, um, uh, a series, in, and um, I, I think it was called something like Things I Wish Jesus Never Said. But I had you do something on your phones, and, and, and I had you look up, and I won't have you do it today, but I had you to actually look up the definition of the word blessed. And it still amazes me every time we say this, and this actually, since then, has really messed me up because I don't know how to use this word blessed anymore. Because if you actually look up the definition of bless, it's, it's this. It's to be made holy. To be made holy. So what John, or what Jesus is telling John is this. Man, you're holy. You're more holy. When you stand strong. You're more holy. Even if everything you're praying for and the answer is no. No. Think back to this passage. The first part of what Jesus was, was saying and doing was amazing. People were getting freed from evil spirits. People were getting healed. People were getting freed from affl uh, affliction and, and leprosy. And all of this stuff was happening. Man, it would have been an amazing time to just be there. And people coming to Jesus and people getting healed. And I'm sure people were, were celebrating and rejoicing. And then Jesus says it. But John... Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. But God, you don't understand what I'm going through. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. But, but you don't understand, like, like, I just need this one thing. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. In chapter 6... Jesus does the Beatitudes. It's this message that he kind of gives out to people. And if you look at verse 20 of Luke chapter 6, you read these words. He says, then he looked up at his disciples and he said, Blessed are you who are poor, because the kingdom of God is yours. Blessed are you who are now hungry, because you will be filled Blessed is the one who weeps now because you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, uh, when they exclude you, when they insult you and slander your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day. Leap for joy. Take note. Your reward is great in heaven. And this is the way their ancestors used to be treated. Treat the prophets. I feel like what Jesus is saying back to John, what he's preached on is sometimes the answer is no, and you got to be okay. Sometimes when, when life's upside down, the answer is going to be no. Sometimes when every prayer that we give and And the question is for us, is when Jesus doesn't meet our expectations, can we still call him God? You can see why this isn't a popular message, because we want Jesus to meet all of our expectations. We want financial security. We want, we want uh, diseases to be healed and, and people to be restored. And we don't want loved ones taken from us. And we want the, the, the perfect family. And we don't want the hurt. And we don't want the pain. And, and we don't want all of these other things that, that sometimes that we, we feel like we're walking through in life. And so we pray to God. We ask God. And we expect God to come through with the answer yes. Because most of us ask this question when it comes to our spiritual walk. Am I happy? Am I happy? Because we want to be happy. 
Is God going to come through with me? Is life going to be better according to this American standard? We have a better life. We have better liberty. We have better happiness. Maybe the best question is this. Am I free? Am I free? One of the best books that I, I, I've ever read, and it's a small one, a guy named Erwin Ir, McManus wrote it, and he wrote it quite a few years ago. It's called The Barbarian Way. And he talks about John the Baptist, and he talks about this very same thing of how sometimes we, we become so on fire for God, and then something happens along the way, and we start to misstep. But he has this quote in there. And he says this, he, he wrote this in his book, The Barbarian Way. Instead of finding confidence to live as we should, regardless of our circumstances, we have used it as a justification to choose the path of least resistance, the, the least difficult, the less sacrifice. Instead of concluding it is the best to be wherever God wants us to be, we have decided that whatever is best for us, to be is where God wants us. And actually, God, God's will for us is less about comfort than it is about our contribution. God will never choose for us safety at the cost of significance. One of the things that's amazing about our God is that no matter what we're facing, he's still there with us. And in the midst of crisis, in the midst of life just being hard, there's still love. There's still, there's still hope for something that is to come. And for some, the answer might be no now, but it's maybe a yes in eternity. And so we start to put all of these expectations on God. We start to make them our cosmic vending machine. If I say the right prayer and put in the right enough of money when the offering goes through, then God's going to come through for me. Or he becomes this genie in the bottle for us that if I have enough faith to do these weird things, then somehow I'm going to be granted these wishes to come. I love the story in the Old Testament of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. About to face the fiery furnace, about to die, and their statement is one of my favorites. And they said to the king, and in essence, you know what? We're not going to bow down to you. And you're going to throw us in the fire. And God maybe will save us. But if he doesn't, I'll still choose him. And I think John was wrestling with the real question that most of us wrestle with. When life is upside down when we're hurting when we're sad and we have these expectations of why hasn't god come through blessed is the one who isn't offended by me holy is the one who doesn't turn away just because life gets hard See, when you make God fit into our expectations of what God should do and who God is and how he's supposed to come through, we make him into more of a little God. And a little God can't save the world. Let me pray and then have a few questions for you guys. Father God, I, I, I know sometimes these are hard truths to unpack and to wrestle with and to be with. But God, I want your truth of Scripture to come out. God, it would be great if every time we, we became a Christian and everything was good and we didn't have any more sickness and we didn't have any more, more issues and, and life was just great. 
But it doesn't work like that. God, I don't know why sometimes you say yes and sometimes you say no. But I trust you. And so God, for me, help me not put my expectations of what you're supposed to do. But God, let me live in who you are. Let me live in your freedom that you provide. Freedom to know that no matter what happens on this earth, your scripture says this earth's going to pass away someday. But you're not. But you tell us we can have joy in trials. We can have peace that passes all understanding. We can feel your love, that we're not alone, that you're walking with us, even in the difficult times. So God, make us holy. Make us not offended by you when you don't meet our expectations. Let us cling to you and not an American version of who God's supposed to be. God, we love you and give you praise and honor. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen. If you're new with us, we do some things that are kind of interesting and different maybe than some of the churches you've been with, but we like to have some times to discuss. And so whether you're at a table or whether you're in a row with someone, um, or I know our students always hightail it over to the corner, someone around you, I have a couple questions for you to just think about and discuss with someone beside you and then We'll close here in a minute of service, but here are the questions. Uh, When was a time that you had high expectations, but then it was this huge letdown for you? Or maybe a time you could switch it, that it was was, you had really low expectations, but but then something came in that was good. And what do you need to do to let go of the question of happiness and start living free with God? Talk to someone around you for a few minutes, and then we'll close here in a few seconds.